think it's always good to be able to take a step back and look at how you're reacting to things and think, right, does this align with the person that I want to become or I want to be? Or does this align with the person that's going to achieve the goal that I'm currently working towards? Mm. You know, maybe you, maybe, maybe something happens and you have a big emotional outburst, and then you can look at it and say, yeah, maybe that was a bit dramatic. Maybe it was a bit over the top. So you know, let's look at why is that happening? What's the meaning that I'm giving to it? Well, the meaning that I gave to it was that um, when I achieved that, I was going to feel really good about myself, and, and that's because I tie my self worth again into getting the result. And because I didn't achieve it, it made me feel like crap. So then now I feel like um, now I've got those uh, negative patterns from childhood coming back up again, telling me that I'm no good. Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. And today we have Jordan Groves. Over the last 20 years, Jordan has trained and coached thousands of people, helping them transform their behavior to achieve their biggest goal and live a more fulfilled life. So far, this includes coaching people in 14 different countries, including England, USA, United Arab Emirates and Switzerland, to name a few. He mainly focuses on productivity and breaks this into three pillars. USDC, urgency, self-discipline, and clarity. Using this USDC method, he helps people to achieve their 12-month goal in just 12 weeks. He has appeared on BBC One, delivered a TEDx talk, presented a stand-up comedy to 400 people, and now r- runs his online coaching business from around the world. Let's bring him on. Hi, Jordan. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. I'm great. I'm yeah. in, uh, currently in Bangkok, so I'm, I'm all good, thanks. Oh, amazing, amazing. What brought you to Bangkok? Uh, well, I've never been over this side of the world before. And I was in um, Mexico and Portugal and Colombia and America. And I just felt like coming over this side of the world to see if I can find somewhere I want to call home, basically. So yeah. I'm just doing, at the moment, I'm doing the whole digital nomad thing where... I'm staying for a month or two in each place and then just carrying on to the next country and just um, basically just working like that at the moment. Well, you've been to many countries because like, like, let's rewind where we first met. So we actually met at a TEDx event, uh, official TEDx event where you were one of the speakers and I was uh, helping out, like organizing it. And um, yeah, so that's where we first met and we just like vibing and then I just couldn't stop like bumping into you. Like we were bumping into each other in like Roger Hamilton's event and all different types of events. It was such a great, like, it was such a great meeting. And um, yeah, since then, like I've been following you and all your journey as well, you know, your uh, you've been through a bit of a um, transformation yourself, haven't you? Let's start off with, um, who are you? Uh, a brief intro, you know, about what do you do? Who is Jordan? Yes. So uh, my name is Jordan Groves uh, and I work as a productivity coach. And um, basically I focus on performance and something that I've just recently put together. I feel like I've uh, found the holy grail of productivity and it's focusing on three areas. I call it the uh, USDC which stands for urgency, self-discipline, and clarity. Oh, amazing. I actually, I'm going to ask you about the, um, you, what's it called? USDC. I'm going to ask you about this. Yeah. Um, but um, let's, let's go back to your childhood. What was your childhood like? What was your upbringing like? What was your surroundings? Straight into the deep stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. This is what we do. This is Soul Awakenings. <laughs> So I, I, I'm luckily I come from a very loving home, two loving parents. Um, my mum was a stay-at-home mother, and my dad was uh, very entrepreneurial, had his own business uh, or businesses, and um, and he did very well as we were growing up. Always had nice cars, was always dressed in a suit and things like that. So I think that had uh, a big impact on the way that I viewed success and my relationship with success. I'd say. Mm. So do you think the um, success is easy to come by, though? Is it? 
to get a roller coaster? Do you want things that are easy to come by? Well, I mean, it depends how you define success because everybody has different wants and needs in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that, but there's no escaping how much easier life is when you have a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, I think, I think one of the biggest stresses that I see with people that have a big impact is financial stress. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can, if we can get to a, a, at least a certain level of success financially, then I think it's um, it it just makes everything else easier because if you don't have that financial stress, then there's um, if you look at a lot, a lot of what causes the arguments at home in relationships and things like that, a lot of it is to do with finances. Mm. Um, so I think if you can take that stress out of it, it just makes everything else easier. Doesn't mean that you're not going to still have problems. Doesn't mean that you're not going to still have other areas to focus on. But I think um, yeah, depending on how you define success, then. Um, I don't think it's easy to come by and I don't think it's easy to change. But I think what you need to do is easy, but it's just be consistent with it. That's the problem. Mm, yeah. And I guess like this is where you coaches like you come in as like, yeah, this is how you do it. Right? <laughs> this is how you do it. I mean, like going back to your dad, like you said, your dad was like in really in a business kind of world. So were you really close to him? Or did you spend a lot of time with him? Because I know when you are so busy with work, um, there's like it's, it's sometimes it's hard to balance life right balance things mm. and so how was that with your with your parents and your dad do you know what? i'll be honest i didn't when i was growing up i didn't see that much other than when we like the weekends and and when we go away on holidays and stuff other, other than that i didn't see that much of my dad because he just he'd work such long hours that i he'd be gone in the morning most of the time before i got up and then he'd be um getting home after i'd already gone to sleep you know, as, as a child. So, um, so yeah, my dad was, would work very long hours. So I didn't really see a whole lot of him when I was growing up. And I, and I, I didn't really, I wasn't very uh, entrepreneurial, I'd say, when I was growing up, whereas my brother was. And, um, and he was very business minded from the get go and um, did very well in school. And, and I was uh, a bit more like the opposite. <laughs> mm. So I, I got more into sports and, um, and I, I kind of became, in school, kind of became a bit like the class clown where um, I'd get in trouble and um, wouldn't really apply myself. And uh, and that that's when, you know, I think it's the story that we tell ourselves is so powerful when we're young. And I built up this story, which is, you know, I can look back at it now and just say it was stupid. But, um, but it's whatever you look for, you will find evidence to back up that belief. If you have a belief about something, if it's strong enough, and my belief I started building, which was nothing to do with my dad or anyone else in my family, but I started building this belief that I was the odd one out in the family and I wasn't good enough and I was stupid and dumb and, and uh, you know, I didn't do well in school, but it was all because I wasn't applying myself. But, you know, I just I wasn't paying attention to those things. So I built up this belief that I was the odd one out in the family and just what and obviously my self-worth wasn't very high. My self-confidence wasn't very high growing up. And, and every time I saw my dad talking to my brother, then... I'd interpret that as uh, he, he preferred my brother and loved him a little bit more than me because he was talking to him more. But in reality, it's just because they had more to talk about because my brother was interested in business and interested in learning. And my dad had loads of self-development books and entrepreneurial books. And my brother was keen to learn from all those. So so obviously, the more in common you have with somebody, the more you're going to talk to them. That's all it was. But I didn't see it in that way. So yeah, so, for, so childhood was very loving, very loving home. But yeah, I, I kind of got lost on, along the way somewhere where I had this skewed image of, of, uh, of I guess, my position in the family, which I'm sure other people can relate to. You know, these stories that we that we uh, that we make up when we're children and then we start finding evidence to, to back up how we feel, even though it's not even though we're not looking at it in the right reality. Mm, yeah. And that that is really, really true. And also. You know, just going back to what you said about your dad not being around that much. That's also, you know, there is a, a study showing that like from the day you're born until the age of seven onwards, that that's when you form attachments to your parents. And that's where the attachment kind of styles kick in, don't they? Um, do you mm. feel that you um, missed out some of the quality time with your dad? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure I did. You know, I just think that when you're when you're trying to achieve the type of lifestyle that we have as a family, we we're lucky to have as a family growing up. Then, then it just it takes a certain amount of sacrifice, and there's there's no getting away from that. And I think that um, 
I think, yeah, yeah, obviously I, I missed out on having a bit more quality time with my dad. But I think um, I think the, the, the main issue was the story that I built up, which kind of, I guess, put a bit of a barrier between us, between me and my dad and me making a bit more effort to to maybe, you know, get to know him on a deeper, deeper level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's all in like going back to your beliefs, so the, the way you... Um... The, it's like almost like creating your own reality, isn't it? Like what you believe is going to manifest into the reality. And that's when the law of attraction kicks in as well. And the universe will show you more and more of that. Right. And so let's go, um, like, you know, going in, in, in what you do as a coach, right? So we talked about belief systems. So what do you do as a coach? What, like, how do you, uh, work with your clients? Yeah, so I, I focus on helping my clients achieve their 12-month goal in 12 weeks. So some people I work with, they already know what their 12-month goal is. Some people don't, and they're not sure. Some people have a loose idea. But basically, I work with them and help them get complete clarity on what it is that they want to achieve over a 12-month period. And then we look at how we can break that down and achieve it in just 12 weeks. Mm-hmm. So and, and like I said, the areas that we focus on are um, creating urgency, um, but first, you need clarity, and that's basically just understanding what the goal is, why you want to achieve it, why it's important to you. Is it actually something that you want to achieve, or is it just something that society's made you think that you need to achieve, or maybe it's something from your parents, and you think that that's what you need to achieve? Because we all, from our childhood, like what we were just talking about, we uh, we feel like we have to be a certain person to receive um to receive attention and to receive love off one of our parents. It's usually whichever parent that you have to work a little bit harder for their attention for, then wh- whoever you have to be to receive attention from that parent, what quite often you'll find that as adults, we're still trying to be that person. So so I look into what kind of person is this person trying to be? Does it align with who they actually really want to be? And if not, then let's look at how we can change that. And then I also look at what, um, coping mechanisms they built up from a child, uh, and and if they're still serving them now, or if they if they're actually turned into self sabotaging behaviours. And in my experience working as a coach, almost all of them have turned into self sabotaging behaviours because they serve us as children, um, where you know we have to go into self nurturing mode. But then as adults, if you keep going into self nurturing mode, every time you get a bit of stress or every time something goes wrong, you're never going to make any progress. And this is what I find with a lot of the people that I work with is every time there's a bit of stress or every time there's a failure, they, uh, they take it so badly that they end up um, just giving up or they end up in this loop where they'll go back to what's comfortable, go into self nurturing mode. And then they'll say, and then they'll remember, Oh yeah, hang on a minute. I've got that goal that I want to work towards and it is important to me. So then they'll start working towards it again, another failure or something else that goes wrong back into self nurturing mode. And then they're just stuck in this never ending loop and they never actually make any real progress. That's what I find. And I, I agree, like you with the uh, comfort zone, because a lot of us do stay love our comfort zone. We don't want to go beyond whether it's to do with work, whether it's to do with the relationship, whether it's which, whichever way life itself. Comfort zone is like where the safety is, but that's where not the growth isn't. So you can't grow staying in the comfort zone. So you have to be constantly pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and even the moving past your fear. Um, it's really important if you want to grow in life because life doesn't stay Mm -hmm. stuck for anybody. It keeps moving and moving and moving. It's just finding that balance where you're not in your nature. Like you said, nature, like 100% of the time, you can have 50% of the time. And then the other, like you got to be productive. You take action on it, right? Yeah. 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 And I, and I find, I find the reason why most people stay in the comfort zone is because they attach their self-worth and what they feel about themselves and how they see themselves, they attach it in the result. So mm-hmm. then the problem is, is when they're working towards that goal, whatever the goal is, might be to do with their health, might be business, career related, whatever it is, they put so much of their self-worth and their identity tied into getting the result that when something goes wrong, then they start worrying, start thinking, oh my God, if I don't achieve this, it's going to mean that, you know, I'm, I'm basically, I'm a waste of space or, you know, I'm no good as a human being or I can't do anything right. And it's because of their attachment to the result. So what I teach people to do is, yeah, still have a little bit of attachment to the result because that's what gets you out of bed in the morning. That's what motivates you. But what you need to do is um, there's a saying where I'm just going to have to paraphrase this, but it's um, something along the lines of um, 
divorce the result and marry the process. Ooh. So that's basically where you just, you, 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 I wouldn't say fall in love because, uh, you know, the process is pretty difficult sometimes because of all the ups and downs, but is where you just learn to uh, appreciate the process. And this is exactly what I just went through with one of my clients the other day. And it's because she was um, suffering with this, where she's put so much attachment uh, into the end result that she was then, um, she was having these big lows all the time, every time something would go wrong. And I said, listen, you need to put your attachment into just taking action every day. So at the end of the day, you can say, right, I'm proud of myself because look, I did this this morning. I did the morning routine. I got up, I did this first before I started work. And then I did this at work. Then I did this. I made that difficult call. I had that difficult conversation. So now I feel good about myself. There's nothing to do with the end result. It's to do with what you're doing on a daily basis. That, that's where people need to attach their self-worth. Mm. And I guess there's like a lot of pressure in that as well, that you are reaching for that end goal. You want something, right? It's okay to have that end goal, but there's also a lot of pressure on you so to fulfill it because it's that fear of failure. Fear of failure kicks in. It's like, what if I can't do it? And that's this little ho obstacle that I'm facing right now. It's, it's, com it's done. I'm done, completely done, you know? Um, and yeah, so I think like I sometimes I've always like um, because of my upbringing and my childhood and the way it's been going, it's like it's not been in a flow of how, you know, people are where, you know, you're you're born and then you go to school and then you're you're um, having to go, go separating from your parents and then you're you're out university work and, you know, nine to five job. I've not had that because I was from day dot, it was a completely diff different opposite life to what like the norm is, right? And so for me to like set those goals, I found it so difficult to set those goals. Because so I thought it's like living just in the present moment is, is how it's done, right? And life will just come to me, everything will just come to me. But I found out that there needs to be a balance in like 50% of like, you actually have to take some action. <laughs> and my, and my, my awakening, like at the uh, six, seven years ago is what um, kind of just changed that to change that uh, mindset. Cause I started getting into law of attraction. It was like, okay, so first, first year of law of attraction, I'm waiting for this, I'm waiting for this. But then the opportunity was presented. So I was like, I'm still waiting for this. It's like, grab it, grab it by both hands. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so and this is this this is my uh, ongoing, I would say, ongoing frustration with the uh, let's call it the law of attraction community, because there's so much in that community where people are like, oh, you know, I'm just going to flow with life, and whatever comes at me comes at me, and and you know, there, I'm just going to get, I'm just going to achieve what I want just by being in the zone, and and it just it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, no. And also it goes back to the positive thinking as well. Mindset is like, you know, we're so afraid of thinking negatively that, oh my God, mm -hmm. we're going to manifest negative things in our life. But actually mm -hmm. those negativities needs to be there. There's a certain times that you're going through like death of your old belief system. I mean, like that's painful. Yeah. How painful mm -hmm. is having go going through a death of an old belief system and a death of something in you? You got to have those negative emotions pop up, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, th and this is the thing, I think we, I think, uh, and definitely now in the self-development industry where there's like, um, there's almost like it's seen as really bad if you're um, in a negative mindset or you're like worried about what can happen in the future. I, I think use that. I think use that to motivate you because the thing is, if all you ever do is think positively all the time, then there's no urgency. And urgency comes, the, the, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more power in energy that comes from thinking, right, what's my life going to look like if I don't do X, Y, Z and I carry on the way I am? This is assuming that someone's not happy with their lifestyle, not happy with their life. So if they know that they need to make changes and they've got some bad habits and they keep doing the wrong thing and they keep, um, keep giving in to those impulses that they know they shouldn't be doing, uh, then obviously something needs to change. And I think one of the most powerful things you can do is think on a regular basis. Mm. Think about, right, what's going to happen 10 years from now? Where am I going to be? What am I going to look like? What's my life going to look like if I carry on with this same routine that I'm doing at the moment, waking up, doing the same thing every day with the same bad habits, giving into the same impulses? 
Like, where's what's going to happen and where am I going to be 10 years from now? And I think that's really healthy to do that. Yeah, and it's really eye-opening for some people as well. They're like, oh my God, mm. I, I don't want to live this life for another 10, 20 years. And that's when the reality hits them because yeah. you don't really think about it. When you're not autopilot, you don't think about these things, right? Um, mm. Like I said, like, you know, for years and years, um, because I was suffering from uh, extreme like anxiety and depression, like to a point I could not leave the house. I was numbing all those emotions. So what I was doing was I was just gaming. I used to be a gamer. I was just morning, get up and play games, evening, play, play games all the time, right? Until when I had my spiritual awakening, reality kicked in. I was like, oh my God, I spent 10 years of my life like this. 10 years of my life and then there ha there had to be a lot of shredding like you know obviously I give in in my talks I talk about quite a lot of trauma work and releasing and purging it out of your system so the old can go so the new can make way but what I do find that often time is when I'm around people or, or people that I meet that the the positivity is is masked like under um under what they're really feeling you know that they're mm. so afraid in society we're so afraid of negative emotions and it's really important for them to be there yeah and i, and I think that just comes from when uh, i think collectively as a country as a world once a consciousness starts raising and people's self-awareness raises more then i think having those kind of conversations will become more normal because let's be honest, at the moment, you know, if you see somebody that you maybe that you don't know very well and they say, how's your day? And you're completely honest and you say, actually, it's not very good. Then, you know, the usually the person's a bit, you know, just yeah. a bit taken well, back and a bit shocked. <laughs> yeah. And they're not sure what to say. They don't know what to do with that information where, you know, I think if we could be more honest like that, then I think it would uh, would help people a lot more. Yeah, and then that's what I say in one of the talks as well. It's like, how check in with yourself. How are you feeling? How am I really feeling today? And if there's an answer, it's like, actually, I'm having a really bad day. I've had a breakdown, had a meltdown. And um, yeah, the reaction is like, they have this um, guard up. It's like, oh, sh this is this is how we're trained. We're not, we're not trained to be open and honest and real about ourselves and our feelings. And that's where a lot of it is like, um, it, it's hard work. It's hard work putting up that mask. It really is. You suffer mm. so much. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about uh, USDC. You talked about it, you know, briefly in our, uh, when we doing an intro. So let's talk about it. What is it? Yeah, sure. So, um, so basically it stands for, like I said earlier, Urgency, sub, um, discipline, and clarity. And these, over the last seven years, I've tried and tested a lot on myself, a lot on the people that I've coached and worked with. And I feel like these are the three areas that are really missing from people taking their, uh, achieving their goals to the next level and their productivity and their performance to the next level. And it basically, it all starts with clarity first. So they have to know what it is that they actually want to achieve, broken down into detail, why it's important to them, how they're going to achieve it, all the way broken down into daily actionable steps. So you've got your monthly target, weekly target, and then daily actionable steps. And then something that I call um, your golden tasks. So your golden tasks are things are, that are always have to uh, come first. And for some people that I work with, it means that they have to get up a bit earlier and do them before they go to their full-time job. Other people I work with that work for themselves, then they can go to work and they can obviously do it at work. So it all depends on the person that I'm working with. But basically, these golden tasks are things they are not just top of the to-do list. They're not just the top priority. These are things where we sit down together and we go through, right, what are some things that are a bit out of the box thinking that are going to create dramatic progress and speed things up for you to achieve that goal that would have taken you 12 months so we would just do one of these. First of all, we start off with one golden task each day. And if you think about uh, generally how productive um, maybe you are on a daily basis and just generally how you've been in the past, maybe. I know in the past, my productivity was terrible. And if I'd have done one important thing each week, I'd be quite happy with that. So if you can imagine the progress, the difference in progress, if you start doing one thing each day, that's really important that you know is going to create real progress. Then if you imagine what it's going to be like with two of those and then three, and then basically we stop with three. And I say, right, you've got to do three of these in the morning uh, before you start your day. 
And then that's why they're able to achieve their 12 month goal in 12 weeks. And it's, a, it's obviously it's a mixture of different things, but it's just it's really not that difficult. It's not that complicated. Mm. You know, it's a, so once they've got the clarity and they know what they should be doing, they know why they're doing it and they know how they're going to get there. Then we move on to creating urgency. And this is a really, really important part of it as well, because quite often we approach things in life where it's almost like we're just on a practice run. And, you know, we'll we'll have something really important that we're supposed to do and it's going to help us. Uh, either it's, you know, something that we've um, that we're doing just for ourselves personally or it's something for our career or something for our business. And then we'll cancel that to just go meet somebody for a coffee mm-hmm. or we'll stay on the phone talking to a friend just about nothing. Like, you know, that friend's on a real hard time. And fair enough, you know, you, but you've got to it's about putting boundaries in place. Urgency is about putting boundaries in place. And it's about you saying, right, this is really important to me. So unless there's a family emergency or somebody's on the deathbed, then nothing's going to come between me and doing what's in my schedule. Mm -hmm. Now, in my schedule, I'm still going to keep free time. So if somebody does need to talk to me and a friend just wants to catch up, I've got free time there. I can still I can I can say to them, hey, I'm not free at the moment because I'm doing this. But at 6 p.m. this evening, let's get on the phone. Let's let's have a talk about it and let's see if we can work out what, what the problem is or see if we can work if there's something wrong with them um or they're struggling with something so so yeah so then so urgency is basically putting boundaries in place and then creating a um a time stamp on what you're going to do so what you're going to do and when you're going to do it by this is daily and then also when you're going to actually achieve the um the end goal by which when you're working with me it's easy because we said it was by the end of the 12 weeks so, so that's urgency in a nutshell. Obviously, we can go into more than that and how to apply it and everything and things that you can do on a daily basis. Um, and then we also have self-discipline. So self-discipline, there's like two sides of the coin with this. Mm-hmm. So I used to say with self-discipline, when I was younger and I just got into coaching, I used to say, right, self-discipline, you know, it's all from the mind because everything comes from the mind. What Your thoughts impact your behavior or, or no, your thoughts impact the way that you feel and then the way that you feel impacts your behavior. And that's kind of the way that I used to, coach all of my clients all the time whereas now I understand after doing it for a lot longer and trying these things with myself I realized that uh, your behavior actually changes the way that you think as well Mm. so if you do both sides of the coin so yes still focus on the way that your your thoughts that you're having and make sure that your thoughts are are positive in a way where they're reaffirming your belief in your own ability to actually achieve that goal and it's not the opposite so make sure your thoughts are aligned with that but then also make sure that you're actually doing what you should be doing on a daily basis, because that is what's going to really, really dramatically improve your self-belief, because that's the thing that stops us. That's the thing that creates um, procrastination Mm. is our lack of belief in ourselves. And the reason we have that lack of belief is because we're constantly on a daily basis. This is usually constantly breaking promises to ourselves and agreements and uh, and commitments that we've made to ourselves. Like, oh yeah, right, this week I'm gonna go to the gym three times and you go once, or you don't go at all. Mm-hmm. Or you say, yeah, I'm going to the gym tonight and then you cancel it because you get home and you're a bit tired and you're just like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, th- these are the things, this is the reason why people always procrastinate because they know based on what they've seen and the evidence that they've gathered up over the years on their ability to carry through and see something through, the evidence just doesn't look good. <laughs> so yeah. that's, this is why this is why with self-discipline it's so important to not just focus on the mind but also really focus on doing what you said you should do and that's and really all it comes down to is just you making a decision and i see and this it sounds sounds a bit cheesy sounds a bit corny even but actually making that decision is really really important i actually had a new client sign up the other day and I was saying to them at the beginning, right, you know, I need you to meet me halfway here. Or I always go through expectations at the beginning. And it took them about five minutes to just say yes, mm. because they were struggling so much with their mindset, struggling so much with them just fully committing. Mm. And then when I asked them, when I was obviously asking them questions, they were saying, oh, it's because, you know, in the past, I've not really stuck at anything before. So I'm just worried about saying yes and not sticking to it. And um, so it, it just shows how powerful this is when we actually say we're going to do something and really mean it, not mm. use. And, and the way the way to know if we really mean it or not is if we're using words like, yeah, I'm going to go to, um, yeah, I'm going to do this now. I'm starting this side business and I'm going to be fully committed to it. And um, 
But I'm, I'm going to start off with trying this in week one. And then, you know, I'll see how it goes and I'll try this in week two. The, the, like, the language is so important. And that's what I always pay attention to when I'm coaching somebody. If they're using words like try, that mm-hmm. to me is a clear indication that they're lacking self-worth and they're lacking mm-hmm. self-belief. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not, it's not just about changing those words, which is also important, but it's about you just doing what you say you're going to do on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. your belief will start to skyrocket. Yeah, and I think it's like really, really true. It's like um, rewiring and reprogramming your uh, brain into a new habit, a new way of being. It's like, you know, for some people it's challenging and that's why it's easier, like stay in the comfort zone, isn't it? Um, and also yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot of fear behind it because it's the unknown. You don't know. You don't know like what, the, 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 what you're going to do. You don't know what's going to happen, but it's just that fear that just holds us back yeah and i and i think the fear again comes from too much attachment to the end result and Mm -hmm. what that means and what the meaning that you're putting on if you fail or -hmm. if you don't get you know we're addicted to instant gratification and this is because we're addicted to dopamine hits you know what it's like we've we've come into this now with the phones and social media and and we're we're addicted to getting the result like this and if we don't get the results straight away then we're like, oh, you know, right, I don't need this because I'm not getting that dopamine hit all the time. It doesn't feel good. Mm. So that's something else that I teach with my clients is to have a dopamine detox and to get away from getting that instant gratification. And again, you know, divorcing the result and just marrying the process and just get more focused on, right, what do I need to do tomorrow? Okay, right, I'm going to fully commit to doing this, 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 and this. And then also with my clients to manage um, expectation levels, I have a three-tiered um, approach where the top tier is amazing. So if I achieve everything that goes in this top tier, I'm going to be like skipping home, dancing through rainbows and whatever else. And then the next one down is it's still all good. I'm still happy with that because I achieved the main things. And the main things I always say with my clients are you've got to get the golden tasks done. Mm. They're the main ones. So as long as you get them done, it's been a very good day. If you get the golden tasks done and then you answer... 100 emails and then you get all the other stuff done and you get all the maintenance based stuff done and just the normal stuff of life and amazing you've had an unbelievably productive day Mm -hmm. but then the lowest tier is you've not done the golden task and something happened in the morning maybe to knock you off your your game and it affected the whole day you emotionally and you just didn't have a good day and then that's when obviously we need to look at why did it affect you that much and again what was the meaning that you gave to it to allow it to affect you so much Mm. And also, I think like it goes, like you said, it goes back to your childhood as well, doesn't it? Like when you can't complete something and there is there's an underlying mm-hmm. issue in the childhood that's been um, like for for so for many for me as well. Like at the beginning, it was like if I couldn't complete anything, I would just feel really bad about it, really, really bad about it, you know, and it's like also also like um coming to coming home to yourself and say it's okay sometimes it, it you know it's sometimes you're not able to do it there's other things that need your attention but how can how can we move past that um that thinking where i failed in this task like how can how can they, how can we move past it like what can we do in that moment when we're feeling like oh i failed and i don't think i'm going to do it the rest of the day how what can we do which it, it, again, it's changing the meaning that you give to that failure. So what I coach people on is whenever you have a failure, let's say, it's just an opportunity to learn. All it means is that you you were you were on the right path and you just slightly veered off. That's all it is. So it's mm. just a realignment. Mm. Whenever you fail, it's there to teach you something. So don't be angry at it. Don't take it personally. You just look at like why you failed. What do you need to adjust to get back on the right path? And it's so it's it's really it's about a lot of it is just emotional maturity, mm. and it's le- it's learning to not always have these emotional reactions to um, every time something goes wrong, which is you know it's, in in a way it is very childlike, and you know, and this took it took me a long time to realize this myself, and uh, and it takes and obviously it takes consistent consistency like anything else, but I think having that. Um, Emotional intelligence, having the emotional intelligence and the self-awareness to look at whenever you have any kind of 
emotional reaction to something, whether it's good or bad, just having that level of self-awareness to take a step back and say, okay, was do I think that that was the right level of emotional reaction? Mm. And maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I think it's always good to be able to take a step back and look at how you're reacting to things and think, right, does this align with the person that I want to become or I want to be? Mm. Or does this align with the person that's going to achieve the goal that I'm currently working towards? Mm. You know, maybe you, maybe, maybe something happens and you have a big emotional outburst and then you can look at it and say, yeah, maybe that was a bit dramatic. Maybe it was a bit over the top. So, you know, let's look at why is that happening? What's the meaning that I'm giving to it? Well, the meaning that I gave to it was that um, when I achieved that, I was going to feel really good about myself. And, and that's because I tie my self-worth again into getting the result. And because I didn't achieve it, it made me feel like crap. So then now I feel like um, now I've got those uh, negative patterns from childhood coming back up again, telling me that I'm no good. Mm. So this is what we this is what's really important as we're going along this path of self-development. And we're trying to grow into the type of people that we really want to become. Whenever we feel bad about something or good about something, it's, we have to become like a detective. We have to be able to take a step back and look at the emotional reaction we had to it. And then it's always to do with the meaning. What is the meaning that we're giving to it? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I always say to people um, that I'm coaching, whenever a failure pops up or something doesn't go wrong, then you have to f- follow three steps. So one, um, why did this happen? Like in detail, why did it happen? Not like a... Not, not an answer where you're just moaning like, oh, I don't know, because I've always had bad luck. You know, like, like a, what's a serious answer where you give um, almost like you're a detective? Okay, why did this happen? Well, it happened because I didn't do X, Y, Z, even though I knew that it was going to lead me to this point. I didn't do it, but though, but even though it still happened, I'm acting like, like I'm surprised now and it still hurt me just the same. Okay, so clearly you need to change something. And then number two is, what do you need to do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? And then number three is what is the lesson and the meaning that you're giving to it? Mm-hmm. And I guess like it's, um, again, it's just like ultimately, like you said, it's going back to like the awareness, uh, how much awareness that you have, how much maturity you have in that awareness. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to go back on like um, self-discipline. <laughs> now that is, you know, it's, it is really, for some people, it is really, really um hard to do i mean if you're starting out if, so, if some of our audiences are starting out at being disciplined at something say if they want to quit smoking they want to eat healthy or get fit or whatever it is where can they start like from the basic of the basic where can they start so they can start rewiring their brain yeah yeah so i have two two really that Easy steps in a way where everyone's going to know how to do it, but being consistent, that's the difficult part, as it always is with self-discipline. But so the first one is never hit snooze on your alarm clock. Oh, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> so, so because I always say how your, how your morning goes dictates the entire day. Mm. So if you think your, if your first decision is I want comfort and I'm going to give myself comfort, how do you think the rest of the day is going to be with self-discipline? Mm-hmm. Just out of the play, just, yeah, nothing. <laughs> There's nothing you just, you, 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 you're basically just making it very difficult for yourself to be self-disciplined. Yes. So as soon as that alarm clock goes off, obviously nobody wants to get out of bed. I don't want to get out of bed. I'm nice and warm in bed. I'm still tired when the alarm goes off. I don't want to get out of bed. Mm-hmm. But as soon as the alarm goes off, if you can get out of bed and do something that you don't want to do, that's the that's the secret of self-discipline. It's doing things that we know are good for us, but are very uncomfortable. Mm. Oh my that's God. That's how to build yes. self-discipline. This is it. This is where it is. It's like so many, um, the, um, again, comfort zone is not being able to make that tough decision. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, being overweight is is wrecking my health but like making that decision to be eating healthy quitting smoking quitting uh binge Mm -hmm. drinking it's it's hard and also it becomes with a societal norm and like this is something i wanted to um ask you like how important it is to be around people who are reaching the same goals in life yeah, it's very important. Just before I get to that, I'll just say number two because I did yeah, say number two. Sorry. Yeah, go so, for it. <laughs> so, so, the, so the second one is if you can get past that, but you've got to complete the first one first. Mm. So if you can get out, out of bed as soon, without hitting snooze, then mm. the second one is you go straight into exercise. Oh, brilliant. 
get up and then get into exercise to get those like yeah. um, energy doesn't, levels up. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't have to be long. So with my clients, I say five minutes of nonstop movement. That's it. Just five minutes. Mm. And it's nothing to do with getting in shape, nothing to do with fitness. It's all mindset. That's the reason why it's in their morning routine. So all teaching them self-discipline. Oh, that's amazing because I'm um, I'm starting the 6, 6 a.m. morning routine right now because obviously I go in schools and some of it is a lot of travel. And at the mm. beginning, I found it so difficult because I just kind of just wake up around slowly, gently around 7, 8 o'clock <laughs> and, you know, just getting on with my day and whatever I need to do and slowly. But then it's like, I have to be in schools by 8 o'clock to so 6 o'clock. You got to get up, right? And you got to travel. So, you know, so I started the routine and it's like, it was so... Um, like I kind of just, I go through the phases of waves of it. So it's like, again, discipline. I'm struggling with the discipline myself because like I was, when I was going in schools, it was perfect. Like I was getting up six o'clock and I was energized. I was, you know, starting my day right. Cause obviously I need to be somewhere. So getting up, so I have a t already a task in hand to do that. I need to be somewhere and d deliver these workshops or whatever. And then, and then when the school stopped and then that's where I stopped as well. And then I'm trying to get that routine back in, but I just love that six o'clock morning routine because it was just getting me in my groove. I was like certain days, I was even like working on my, my workshop bits in hand because that's my, mm. my brain was so active in that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I love think, it. I think, I think once you, once you get over the hump and you, and you can get over the fact that you get getting up earlier, I always say to people that if, Let's say you're, um, let's say somebody tricked you. And when you were going to bed, when you were, let's say you went to the toilet and you left the room and let's say one of your family members or friends came in the room and they changed the time on your phone, right? So they changed it so that, let me work this out now. <laughs> so they changed it so that, uh, so they made it later than it was so that your alarm so when you, when you go up in the morning, basically when you go up in the morning, you, you think it's still 8 a.m. But in fact, it's 6 a.m. Ah. So the phone says 8 a.m., yeah. but it's actually 6 a.m. Uh -huh. Now, when you get up, you might there might be a small piece of you that thinks, God, I feel a little bit more tired today, but you'd still get up the same. You do everything the same. But yet, as soon as somebody like, suggests or advises that you get up at 6 a.m., it's like, oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, my God, no, I can't do that. <laughs> And it's, so it's just, it's all perspective and it's all attitude towards mm. time. And I always say to people, listen, if you need eight hours, it's not a problem. It's good to bed earlier. Yes. Yes. Not a problem. How, how do you keep with the schedule though? Like sleeping, at, I, I find that sleeping around at 9.30 and 10 is perfect time for me to sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then wake up I, like I think the same. Time. Yeah. And, I, and I, think, I think you need two things. This is what, because... Again, this is something that pops up a lot with the people that I work with when I start suggesting, looks to me like you need to get up earlier to fulfill what we're going through before you get to work and just to do your morning routine, etc. So I say, right, you need two things. Otherwise, this is going to be impossible because nobody can just go to bed earlier because you're not tired. You used to go into bed at a certain time. Mm. So you can't just go to bed and fall asleep or you'll just be lying there staring up at the ceiling. So you have to have two things. One is you get up early first. That's number one. Number two is exercise. Go to the gym and have a full session in the gym. Mm. So then you're tired because you've got up earlier than usual and you're tired because you've been to the gym. And then I guarantee you it will be much easier to go to bed earlier than it would be if you don't have those yeah. two things in. Yeah. And also if, you, um, if you're starting out, I, I find that uh, dancing as well, like just put um, music on and just dance and just shake that body like to exercise yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you feel like oh, yeah. i'm like okay i haven't joined the gym yet but let me just dance so start it off with dancing yeah, yeah. And you'll be dancing to the gym <laughs> yeah well i mean any, any kind of exercise yeah it doesn't have to be the gym you, you can go out for let's say if you if you don't do any exercise then just go out for a fast walk anything that just gets your heart rate up mm, there. yeah yeah oh, perfect i actually forgotten the um question that i asked you <laughs> yeah. do you remember do it? I, I, how important it is to surround yourself with people that are on the yeah. same journey. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, that, that's something that, that I find difficult at the moment because I'm moving around so much. And mm. it's um, I, I was having a conversation with somebody else that I'd met in Mexico, and he's here in Bangkok, so I went to meet him the other day and had a catch-up. And I was saying to him, you know, this it, it, there's so many 
um, extreme highs and extreme lows in this lifestyle at the moment because one minute I'm looking at a beach that looks like a photo, it doesn't even look real because the yeah. colors are just unbelievable. And then the next minute, you know, I feel, I'm feeling like a bit isolated and I'm like miles away from anyone else that I know and there's nobody else around and maybe something's gone wrong that day and I'm not feeling great about it. And, um, and, I, and, it, and it's, it's difficult for me at the moment to surround myself with those people. So the way that I combat that is I just make sure I'm always listening to something that's teaching me something, mm. whether it's um, if I need something emotional, then I'll listen to somebody that's um, obviously teaching you something about how to um, monitor your emotions, maybe some techniques on how to improve your mood, things like that. Because I'm always I always want to learn, always want to learn something new, always want to try things. So I just basically, I, the kind of people that I want to be around, I just listen to them on YouTube, basically. When I'm in this type of situation now where if I'm not settled in one place, which mm-hmm. I, I would imagine is, is the situation for most people listening. Um, if you're settled in one place, I'd say it's a lot easier. You just have to make sure that you're making an effort to find the type of places where those people are going to be. Mm. Obviously, you know they're not going to be in nightclubs and bars and stuff. But no. um, if you if you, if you can find if you can find networking events, um, if you can um, go on uh, what's the name of that website? Uh, meetup Meetup dot com mm. is really good. I used to use that a lot when I lived yeah, in Manchester. Yeah. That's really really good. Yeah. So I and I and I think yeah, I think it's very very important because I think if you're if you're around people that don't have the same type of um, ambition, let's say, as yourself, and they don't have the same wants and needs in terms of wanting to grow into a different type of person and wanting to grow as a person, then the conversation is going to be very different. Yes. And I, I, was, I, I, I always know when, I, when I'm around people that are, that are interested in self-development, that want to grow, want to learn, then they're very solution-based. That's the big difference. Mm. They don't talk about the problems all the time. They might talk yeah. about a problem, but then they'll straight away t- start talking about what they think the solution might be. Yes. Whereas when I'm, when I'm, yeah, that's what you want. So, and what I notice is sometimes when I'm around other people, they just tend to like talking about problems and tend to like talking about gossip, let's say. And I, I, I call it surface level conversation. And I uh, I hate it to be honest, and uh, and that's the biggest difference I notice with if I'm around people that want to grow and they're interested in self development and they're nice people, then I feel energized when I've been with those people. And then if I'm around people that just want to talk about gossip and want to talk about um, I don't know stuff that's going on with celebrities, then I feel absolutely drained if I leave oh, spend yes. time with those people. I know. And it's like, it's so relatable. So, so relatable. I think it's, it also goes back to the level of consciousness and, and um, awareness that you have as well. Cause when you're on this personal development path, you're changing at a rapid pace. And it's like, it's so important to be around people who are, who are also doing the same. Right. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting that you said, like, if you are, match with someone whether it's your friends whether it's your even family or whether it's your partner and they're not on the same vibe or vibrational match where they don't they just want to talk about how how the how bad their life is and uh, want to play the victim and that's okay where they're at but for you to take that on and it's like no there's much more than that you know you have to be mm-hmm. self-centered so you have to be in the center of you to to just just acknowledge that they're there where they need to be at right and that's perfectly fine but is it is yeah. it really helping your growth is it really helping mm-hmm. you thrive and and i guess like you know um i do exactly the same when you know, when I'm not around surrounding myself with people who are, you know, like, you know, obviously thriving and growing, what I do is there's a, there's a period of time where universe just comes in and just brings these people and then you learn what you need to learn and then you, you kind of just move on and then there, there's that void, isn't it? I'm sure you've felt that as well. There's mm-hmm. a void. And then after the void, then comes a new energy and new people who are like, you know, uh, will help you to upgrade to a next level. So in that void, what I do is exactly what you do is like listen to motivational videos, 
uh, watch personal development stuff, like you said, with with like uh, if I'm having trouble with relationships, okay, well, what is it I'm learning that? And if I'm having trouble with like, okay, well, I'm I'm dwelling on my depression quite a lot. What am I doing? I'm listening to like Les Brown, Tony Robbins. Uh, I'm listening to there's another guy called Your World Within. He's he's great. Like you know, he's he comes out with such an amazing life philosophy. And I was like, I was just wake up to that in the morning, and that's your that's that's your day. So you basically be your own anchor, right? You be your own yeah, anchor. yeah, yeah. And that and so and and I feel to be honest, I feel like I need it sometimes because if I, if I'm around people too much then I start feeling like, oh man, I need, I need some time by myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, it's, is, it, is, it, is it a different balance for everybody, depending obviously if you're extrovert or introvert, then it, it, it's, it's very different for each person, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like, it's really um, important to find that balance as well. Um, so going back to the morning routine, like you talked about, a bit about morning routine, you know, setting the alarm and how important is it? Like, why do people need to do it? Oh, well, it's because of what I said before, it, yeah. it basically sets the tone for the entire day. Mm-hmm. And if you think like our brains, the patterns that we have uh, are like software, it's like a computer. So, you know, like, like what you were saying, zero to seven years old, they, they say that that's when we're programmed. That's what Dr. Bruce Lipton calls it. He said that's when we're programmed. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so then we have these patterns that then we spend the rest of our lives trying to break and trying to change. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, I, and I think a big part of it is the way that we start the day. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, you know, there, there's plenty of people that can get up without, well, I would definitely wouldn't say plenty, but there are some people that can get up without a morning routine and still achieve great results. But my argument would always be whatever kind of results you're achieving, whether they're good or great, whatever, would always be better with a routine, some kind of routine. It doesn't have to be the one that I advise, but a routine that you find that's uh, personalized to you, mm-hmm. that just helps you because sometimes... We wake up in the morning, we're just in a bad mood and we don't even know why. Mm-hmm. Or we're just not in a very good mood. Whether that's to do with our dreams or something, like who knows, or whether it's to do with the food that we've eaten and that's affecting our hormones, who knows, you know what I mean? But, I, but, or, but what I do know is if you're consistent with a morning routine and you're controlling your emotional state, then you're controlling what you're focused on mentally. So you're straight away, you're... Um, um, you're, you're changing the way that your your uh, the patterns of your brain, which direction they're going in, then it's going to make a big difference on the way that you communicate. It's going to make a big difference on the way that you behave. It's mm-hmm. going to make a big difference on the way that you react to things that are going wrong in the day. Mm-hmm. So if you start if you start the day and you're thinking about and you have to like with, with my clients, I get them to focus. I call it the five five five. So it's five minutes of movement first, mm-hmm. then it's five minutes of gratitude. And they have to think of three things they're grateful for and three reasons why for each thing. Mm. Then they have to visualize. The third one, the last one, is visualizing the type of person that they want to be that we've already gone through. Um, So what type of personality traits, what type of habits do they have? How do they react to problems? And I get them to visualize themselves already being that person, but not just so everything's perfect, but they visualize, right, when something goes wrong, I'm going to react like this. If something, if this happens, I'm going to react like this. And if this happens, I'm going to react like this. Mm. So that you're training yourself to react in a certain way. You're not just thinking of um, unicorns and rainbows all the time, like everything's going to be smooth running, because obviously mm. life isn't like that. No. So, so that's a, that's a slight difference. And I think when you go through that, it's a massive, massive difference between when you finish that 15 minutes compared to just rolling out of bed and starting the day like mm. normal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That's absolutely perfect. Um, I wanted to touch base on the, um, depression as well. Cause I'm, I mentioned, um, a bit about it now, you know, I know probably many of our listeners are, um, are suffering, um, through like mental health problems or, um, they've gone through, um, a loss of a loved one or, or they've just, you know, gone through a breakup or whatever. How can we stay productive in when we're in that zone? Wow. I mean, obviously, there's many different levels, isn't there, to it? And I'm, you know, just for the record, I'm no doctor. So this is what I'm about to say now is not advice in this area. Um, but but yeah, I, I when I was younger, uh, because I was just so positive and happy going all the time, I my attitude was like, I found it hard to relate to people that had depression because my attitude was, um, I just don't see like how that's possible. You know, how when life's 
so amazing. There's all these amazing things to experience and everything in life. How can people be like that? That was my attitude when I was younger. And uh, and it's, it's funny, you know, obviously, as you get older, you realize that uh, all your perspective on life and your attitude and everything changes vastly because you go through more things and you go through more trauma and you experience more things. And then it makes you relate a lot more to people. Mm -hmm. And I would say um, a couple of years ago, I had a spell where my mental health just plummeted like really, really badly, probably to the, the other than I'm trying to think now, but I mean, I'm not going to compare it to other things like when my dad passed away, but it was, let's just say it was very low and low to the point where I was having suicidal thoughts uh, on a daily basis. It never got to the point where I started thinking about, right, how would I do it? And when am I going to do it? Never got to that point, but I was thinking about it on a daily basis. And, um, and, uh, and I remember thinking one day, like, wow, how have I got here? You know, when I, 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 coach people so that you know you don't ever get to this point and i help people so that you don't ever get to this point and i've done all these things my whole life just so i would never get to this point but i did the i did the cardinal sin which was which is why now i have a massive focus on it and it was me putting all of my self-worth in achieving this one goal that i had and it was it was a financial goal it was a really big goal something that i'd never achieved before and i was getting really close to hitting it and i basically I I um, separate myself away from everybody else. I stopped meeting up with people for three months. I stopped like partying, like no alcohol or anything. I was going to the gym all the time. Like I was fully focused, like monk mode, some people will call it. <laughs> and, uh, I was fully focused. Like Nutrition was amazing. Training all the time. Completely productive up at 6 a.m. every day. And, um, and I did everything right. And I was like right on the fence to achieving it. And it was going to be the best month I'd ever had in my coaching business. And it went from being this close to them being the worst month that I'd had in years. Really? And it just, and I, and I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much importance I put on it. And I didn't realize how much of my self-worth I'd attached to it. Um, I didn't, well, obviously I did realize that because it hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just took it really hard. And what was crazy was that I had all these old, um, all these old thinking patterns from when I was a child about being worthless. All of them all came up to the surface that I'd completely forgotten about, mm. and uh, and and all of them were all coming up, and they were really strong as well. I was like, "What the hell?" I felt like I was getting possessed or something, mm. and um, and I and I couldn't believe how strong they were, and then. And, you know, it was just, yeah, it was really bad. And I, and I was really low. And then I stopped everything that helped my mental health. I stopped doing it. So no more morning routine. Stopped going to the gym. I stopped, like, eating. So, like, I was losing loads of weight and everything. Like, uh, and then, obviously, it wasn't, didn't, every time I looked in the mirror, I didn't like how, how I looked in the mirror because I was losing all my muscle mass and everything. And, um, and I was like this for, I think now how long it lasted, probably about six weeks. And um, and that and this is when I was I, I was traveling around still, and that and that was one of the main reasons why I decided to come back to the UK because I thought you know if I get any worse than this then you know it's it's not going to be good. So um, so I thought I need to see my family, I need to see my family and friends. Mm -hmm. So I came came back to the UK and almost instantly I started feeling better. And I just um, and then when I got around people that cared about me, and I just I guess got some love from those people. And then, and then I, I, I guess I had a bit more clarity on to think properly, and, and I thought, right, you know, I need to start getting a bit more active again. So I started getting a bit more active again. And it's not like it changed instantly. I was going to the gym and everything, but those thoughts were still there. And it's like it took a while to get rid of them. It's like I'd opened the door, and they were like, and I just couldn't shut that door because they were just. I, it's like I'd, it's like I'd created a new neural pathway in my brain. So then it was like it was still firing on a daily basis because it had been doing it for, you know, six weeks or so. Mm. And then it was only over time, bit by bit, it started going away more and more and more. And then I like, I, obviously, I got back to doing my morning routine and um, got back to being really active again. And then uh, and then it was just a, um, a really, really important lesson to me on how important it is to not attach our self-worth to any goal. Yeah. And uh, and that's why I talk about it so much now. And that's why it's a big part of the USDC method that I teach is mm. just um, is detaching ourselves from the result and just attach yourself to the process and what you need to do on a daily basis. 
Yeah, I mean, like, it's really, like, relatable what you just said about, um, like, really focusing on all your trauma of whatever that needed to clear came up for you. And in that period of six weeks that, I guess, you needed to, because we get caught up on doing, 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 doing. And then when something Mm. happens, like, say, a loss of a loved one or heartbreak or anything, we're still in that doing, 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 doing mode that we don't really process it properly. And what's, what, what often happens is that um, something happens, something needs to break at a certain point mm-hmm. for you to stop, right? Sometimes you get injury yeah. that you can't move or um, you can't walk or you get like um, illnesses that you, you need to sit down and you have to, you're faced with that, with that uh, trauma or whatever's happened, right? And yeah. What I found really beautiful uh, while you were sharing that, thank you for sharing that, by the way, um, um, that, you know, during that period, you while you stopped doing everything, you needed to co-regulate with other people. So you went back to yeah. your family, you went back to your friends to help you co-regulate because we can't do everything on our own all the time. We can't. We sometimes need help. And in those mm. periods where your nervous system is dysregulated is when you need support from other people and the, lo- the love and family. And like, you know, over the last couple of months where I've, be- I've been going through something similar where, you know, I had a breakup and then the my nervous system just already knew what it was doing, but I had to, I had to let it, let it process. And then I was tapping into my friends, my family, the beautiful people around me of community of people around me and now it's like okay two months of that one month of that one and a half month of that that's it I'm back I'm back with the bang I'm doing this podcast again I'm doing all the things that I love doing again I'm going like energized and like you know it's this is it like you know we're in this world together at co-regulating and they they help you to achieve your goals as well because they're they're Mm. there to help you nourish and, and give you that love that um, your goal was to just get out of that six weeks period, that that depression and that low hit, right? So I yeah. think it's really, really, be- it really beautifully summed it up. Like you know, um, achieving those goals, um, sometimes we have to hold, hold, so mm-hmm. we can process our own stuff, internal stuff that's going on inside yeah. of us. And, I, and I'm a, a big, big believer in um, achieving your goals. But what what I've learned obviously as I've got older is that um again just um to do with putting yourself worth into the end result is that um you've got to do it just because you enjoy growing and you enjoy learning Mm. that's Mm. it you know you've got to do it because you enjoy doing it so like when you're whenever you're whatever the goal is whatever you're working towards you've got to remind yourself like I still have to remind myself as well it's like I'm doing this just so I can just so I can grow as a person because the the real value yeah obviously the end result is always fun you know of course it's fun and it's i mean you know it's going to give you a certain level of um enjoyment maybe happiness to a certain degree but the real value is always in the journey because that's when you grow the most and that's when you have the most difficulties that's when you have the most challenges because you're trying to change your behavior you're trying to change your habits Mm. so that's where the real value is and and it's not this it is difficult to um not to understand it, but I think it's difficult to to um, to really believe that mm. because obviously when you're struggling to change and things aren't going right and um, and you're trying to change your behaviour and maybe people around you aren't helping, then it's really difficult to to believe that that's where the value is because it's not making you feel very good. Mm. But but I think life has a funny way of teaching us. And especially when you're striving, you're trying to grow as a person. Life will keep giving you these situations that cause pain, that cause suffering, that cause stress, that cause anxiety. You will keep getting them until you can create healthy coping mechanisms. Mm, yes. It's it's a bit like the um, a cold virus, right? You got to have cold or flu to have, so to be immune to it. So, you know, your body knows what your body automatically knows. Well, I know I've been through this strain before. You're not getting past me. So you don't get it. You don't feel full ill of it. So it's the same with yeah. like your uh, goals in life is same with relationships as well. You keep repeating the same patterns and patterns over and over again, it's it and habits and things and, and until um, you suffer enough to say, I want to change now. That's the thing. And that's it. Enough. 
Yeah, that, that's, that's the most pow powerful driving force is always suffering. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. And yeah. Um, like when I used to work as a personal trainer, some of the most motivated people I've ever worked with were people that had just come out of a relationship. <laughs> oh, no, oh my God, that's their, so true. Their motivation, honestly, it was like up here. It was <laughs> yeah. insane. It was so much fun working with them because they're just like, right, you want me to come in at 6 a.m.? I'll be here. I'll be here every day. <laughs> and then my other ones that were happily married, they're like, oh, 6 a.m., oh, can we make it next week? And I'm just like, wow, what a difference. Oh my god, that was I was gonna talk about this. It's like using while you were talking about this, it was like using your pain as power, and that's what I've always been good at doing. It's like um mm -hmm. coming out of a relationship or coming lo losing somebody or something. There's something painful, and I somehow just channel it like raw, mm. and then and that's where my personal development comes in. And then when I, everything's like settled and I'm content, it's like that's when I kind of just get a bit lazy, especially in my goals yeah. as well. And then, and then, and yeah, then yeah. the universe is like, I'm gonna send you the situation again to just like kick, kick you up the bum again, so you can just carry on with it. <laughs> well, well, the thing is that the sad thing is, is some people are suffering but they're just uh, they're suffering to a point where it's not causing enough pain so mm. somebody else like a friend might look at it and be like wow if i was in that situation i would change this this and this but that's because we all have different gauges of mm. pain and suffering we all have different standards and we all have different um uh different pressure points of what we're willing to put up with Mm -hmm. and for yeah. some people and, and again you know i would say again this is tied into self-worth mm -hmm. and how much you value yourself because when your self-worth is sky high and something starts causing pain mm -hmm. you'll change it like that mm -hmm. because you know it's not good enough for you yeah and i said i guess like um something just come in how do you ignite that fire in you like no we can't have it all the time most of the time mm. but how do you have that ignite like you just like oh you i just got out of a relationship bang 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 i'm achieving my goals and like i'm, I'm doing amazing well and, and then that, <laughs> that kind of just hits low how can we just like bring that out in ourselves that fire well, it's, a, it's like it's like it's like a balancing act so i always say to people that i'm coaching i would say listen we're not going for 10 out of 10 productivity on a daily basis mm. we're just going for seven or eight mm. at the moment you're at three so <laughs> we get seven or eight that's amazing yeah like your life will like in six months your life will look unrecognizable yeah. like it will be in, in 12 weeks that's what i coach them on but in like six months a year two years five years you'll like it will just be completely unrecognizable if you just do seven or eight on a daily basis you don't need to do 10 mm -hmm. so that's the difference because when you come out of a relationship or something really traumatic it's like a slingshot because you get <laughs> pulled back so far so far the extreme of the other way it's like boing straight back <laughs> the other way and then you come flying in towards your goals with so much energy and so much uh oh so my much God, um, that's so belief that I hope, and, I and the thing is the thing is yeah. that is just it's not it's not um sustainable it's not sustainable no. because you can't sustain because it, you know obviously your your uh, energy levels and stuff are going to come down different things are going to happen in life there's distractions and things so the the goal is to aim somewhere um just past halfway so that you're you're aiming for that seven or eight of performing at your best and yeah. then if you can do that you're not stressing yourself out trying to hit 10 all the time but every now and again you know, maybe there's something big that you want to go for and, and you want to achieve it in a very small time frame. Let's say you're going for something in 30 days and you'd be like, right, I'm going to do a sprint. So I'm going for nine or 10 every day. But then as soon as I finish this 30 days, I'm going to have a day off and then I'm going to drop down to five. Then I'll up it to six. Then I'll up it to seven. And I think it's just everyone. It's, a, it's about understanding and thinking about, right, what's the healthiest approach for me to for me to take here where because I think what happens with some people is when they come out of a relationship and let's say the gym for example they're super committed to the point where they've gone from one extreme to the other and then because it's not sustainable they'll they burn out and then mm. they go right back to zero which mm. is where maybe they used to be and then they never start it again mm. so the so you shouldn't you should always think right what what I'm doing right now is it sustainable that's why, you know, I hate people going on these diets and stuff. Just eat healthy, mm. right? Stop mm. stop focusing on achieving a certain amount of weight by the end of the 30 days and just focus on the type of lifestyle that you mm. should have to be a healthy person. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I guess it's, it's identity. Some, yeah, and I guess it's something else just came up is like um, igniting that fire energy. It's like doing, um, like you said, going to the gym or with some sort of form of exercise. Maybe it's badminton, maybe it's football. It's it brings that like fire energy out of you, and then you're like, yes. And also the going back to the motivational. Um, audios that we listen to as well that that keeps your fire going so if you have Les Brown on on repeat over and over again <laughs> you are getting fired up <laughs> yeah I, I would say I would say that that definitely helps but it's nothing compared to when you get consistent with your self-discipline mm, mm, yes because yes. when you start when you start getting up and you stop hitting snooze yeah. and then you start working out in the mornings Believe me, like your your motivation goes higher and higher and higher, and then you'll feel less and less need for even listening to stuff like that. Mm. So you know when when you go through the morning rut routine like first time, like so th for how many days do you think it's like? It's it's about thirty days where you feel a bit uh like because you're merging into new routine. It's like it's it's rough. Is it? Did you think it's rough at the beginning? Like your body. And I think. Emotionally? I think it's I think the, the difficult part at the beginning, again, is doing something that's going to take you away from the most comfortable thing at that moment in time, which is mm. one, getting out of bed when the alarm goes off because it's comfortable in bed. So that's number one. Then having to do the routine when, um, when maybe you, it, it's very difficult to articulate the difference that the routine makes. Mm. It's difficult to, for me to articulate that because it's, it's more of a feeling and feeling is just not sexy. It doesn't sell. Do you know what I mean? So when you're trying to sell something to somebody, sell the idea of doing a morning routine, and you're like, oh yeah, but you'll feel amazing. They're like, mm, okay, you know, it's like <laughs> it's just it's just not very believable. So yeah. it's it's just one of those things where, um, like we were saying earlier, two sides of the coin of self of self discipline and controlling your thoughts. So one side is controlling your thoughts, and then the other side is you've just got to do it. And then when you do it, then you'll start to feel the benefits and see and experience the benefits. So uh, yeah. I think that you, you just have to, yeah, I would say minimum amount of time is 10 days. And after 10 days, you will definitely notice the difference. And mm. usually, I even from some clients, I even start getting feedback that their partner has started saying stuff to them because they've even noticed the difference. Wow. And, and even people at work, even people at work are saying, hey, you know, you seem like uh, really energized. You know, you're having like a few espressos or something. What's going on? Yeah. And um, so I've had I've had a lot of comments like that over the years from people where when they get when they get consistent with the morning routine. And I would say it's it's two things. One is being consistent, and two is approaching it with the right attitude. Mm. And that is very very important as well. Because again, somebody recently that I was working with, they'd done it for ten days and they still weren't really seeing or experiencing the benefits. And when I started asking them about like how, what they were thinking about in the morning before they were doing it, basically they were just constantly telling themselves, I don't want to do this. I hate this. Mm -hmm. And if you approach anything like that, obviously yeah. it's not going to have the impact that, you're, no. that you desire or that you want. No. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm loving this conversation. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so we covered like um, a lot of things in, um, in, um, in our interview today. So, um, I just wanted to ask you, what is the greatest skill can anyone, um, someone have? The greatest skill? Yeah, the greatest skill that someone can learn or have. I, I mean, obviously, there's a lot, and it depends on situation, but I would say, funnily enough, we've just been talking about it, it's self-discipline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> true. Because true. with self-discipline, everything is easier. Everything. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Like, yeah, I know. Like when I was in that, the getting up six o'clock, it was just, yeah, it was just amazing. It was just such an amazing feeling. And, and you, you, it's like, um, do you think that we need to fill our day up at least? Um, so you, you can, you, you're disciplined enough to do it. Do you think that? Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Like with everybody that I coach, a big part of it is the calendar. But like you have to have something you're working with, whether it's a diary or a calendar, something. And I say, right, the the mantra I want everyone to adopt that I work with is if it doesn't get scheduled, it doesn't get done. And that mm. means everything in your life, everything. Mm. So if you if you value time with your partner, then it should be in your schedule. If you value time off, we well, don't do anything. 
It should yeah. be in your schedule. Like everything needs to be in there. And I know for some people listening, they're like, oh, man, that sounds way too planned. I like to go with the flow a bit more. Yeah. But, you know, with those, when I've come across, I'm not saying this is everybody, but my experience of when I've worked with people like that is they are the people that are frustrated the most because they don't achieve what they know they could achieve. They're yeah. not fulfilling their potential and they're not becoming the person that they know they really desire to be. And yeah, it's because they're... they're they're too far the other side of the spectrum where they're just mm -hmm. in the flow and just oh I'll do whatever I feel like doing yeah. and you know that there's, there's got to be some organization in there as well if you apply your creativity to the organization that's when amazing things happen yeah I mean like I've, I've kind of been guilty of that in the past where I've just always been in the flow just being honest like um it's like well I'll just go with the flow and move here and move there and move here but um, I do, I am really recently, I'm finding that perfect balance where I do have like whole period, like the, this is the day I'm going to rest. This is the day I'm going to do this. This is the day I'm going to do this. I have it in my calendar and I started doing that. And also I'm inviting the flow in as well. So it's giving a bit of room for the flow and the planning. And I think, cause it's like, mm -hmm. like you said, you don't want to be in too extreme on the other end. So whether you too extreme flowy or you too extreme planning, cause then you'll be rigid right you gotta be mm. in some way in the middle but I, so i always say like because i've had this said to me before with people that just very that don't like to have a plan you know they don't like to follow a schedule and i say to them listen you can put whatever you want in the schedule so mm. if you want like four hours of just being in flow state where you don't follow a schedule just put that in the schedule <laughs> Do you know yeah. What I mean? it's like... <laughs> yeah yeah and it just so, comes so naturally think... then yeah yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that once once people uh, experience what it's like to be organized, they'll understand and they'll see the value in it, that it's mm. an absolute game changer. Mm. Like it's, it's, it is, sounds cheesy, but it is life changing. It's like you go up to the next level, whatever level, you know, you perceive that to be, but it's like you go up in there. Uh, I think I always think, you know, I, I kind of laugh around and I say joking with some of my friends that, you know, oh, we never want to grow up, you know, let's take kids, you know, and just be like immature for all, for all of our lives. But I think there's certain things in life that help you mature mm -hmm. and you get to almost get to the next level of adulthood, shall we say? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that being organized and managing your time is a big part of that. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree, totally agree. Wow, Jordan, what an interview. This is Oh my God, like so many insights and so much um, of my own learning, actually. I, I want some of the things that I want to implement on. It's like it's given me kind of motivation to just carry on that 6 a.m. routine and um, and just like nice. thriving in it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's like it's timely that I've, I'm in interview you now. And I'm sure there's many of our listeners who are in the same boat and it's going to just might have just give them that motivation to just just push a little bit further with the self-discipline mm. um yeah and that's what we want right and they say that every everything comes to you at the right time so if you're in that uh, if you're resonating with this this is your calling this is this is it this is your message from the universe to say yeah yeah go ahead i think <laughs> i think there's a there's a lot in self-development that talks about self-love right like there's retreats everywhere and everything there's books out about it and the ultimate in self-love is self-discipline Yes, yes, because you the, the, it takes discipline to self love yourself as well. It does. <laughs> like if you know you need to go to the gym, and that's you giving yourself self love because you're looking after this body that we're in, then yes. obviously you know you need to be able to stick to that and be consistent with it. Yeah. And if you know that putting yourself first is going to be good for your mental health because yeah. you're let's say you're people pleaser and you're always putting other people first before your own wants and needs then that is self-love and self-care. So self-discipline yeah. is all about our relationship with ourselves. Mm, with ourselves and setting those boundaries as well. When you want to yeah. say no, you got to say no. And that's something that I'm yeah. really, really honing in at the moment as well. Wow. Um, thank you, Jordan. I've got like quick uh, rapid fire questions for you. Um, well, it can be quick and <laughs> yeah. you can expand on it as much as you want. But yeah. Um, so just going to ask you these questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, man. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. yeah man. This is going to be great. Um, is there any prize money? Oh, no. Uh, no, just this interview. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Um, good answer. Um, right. So, um, what is your definition of universe, God, or life? 
Wow. <laughs> that, that, that was going to be a rapid fire question. Oh my good lord. Um, like I said, so you my, can my, my definition, my understanding of God, universe, I use the word God. I know, but again, so the only reason why people don't like God or they don't like universe is just the meaning again that we give to this. But my understanding, my own personal belief is that it's all the same thing. Hmm. So consciousness, collective consciousness, God, universe is all the same thing. And my, again, you know, this is my own understanding and my own belief is that all religions are basically going to the same thing. I think as human beings and as a race, we like to categorize things. And I think that's what we do with religion, just like we do in sports. Hey, my team's better than yours. Come and join our team. Mm. And that's what religion does. You know, whether it's one religion calling names that the other one say, no, ours is right. Ours is more this. And we've got this evidence to back it up. And everybody's always arguing. Obviously, you know, I just think that if people could be a bit more uh, understanding and a bit more open and, uh, and accepting whether people's beliefs, then um, then obviously it doesn't matter what belief anyone has then, as long as you're... I think as long as you're being a good person and you're um, and you're leading a life of uh, of uh, of trying to be an inspired person mm-hmm. and um, and like for me, I pray. I pray to Jesus. I'm not Christian, but I pray to Jesus and I and I um, I, I I tap into I guess what you could call the law of attraction. But I know since I've started praying more in the last. I would say only like the last six months, really, then um, big things have started happening. And I've noticed a big change. Now, how you want to explain that? I don't know. Do you yeah, know what I mean? think, yeah, completely relatable. It's like really, really, it really does make a difference. And then a lot of opportunities. Mm-hmm. And then you have that certain faith as well, like, you know, um, yeah. where you're heading, you're, you know, you're going to get there. It's just being disciplined mm-hmm. in it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think since, since, I've start, since I've started praying, then... I feel like the the messages of what I should do and shouldn't do are a lot clearer. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Totally relatable. Mm. Yeah, perfect. Um, what do you think happens when you die? <laughs> well, after my dad after my dad passed away, I got obsessed with watching near death experience videos. Mm. So it'd all be these people. Like I'm telling, I watched. I don't know how many hours, but I watched hours and hours and hours for for months. I would watch like almost daily. I would watch somebody, and there's a, I can't remember the name of the channel now, but there's a couple of really good channels on YouTube where it's these people retelling what happened and what they saw. Mm. And um, so now I'm absolutely convinced. Before I just wanted to believe because it'd be nice to believe that we go somewhere. Yeah. Whereas after listening to all these and now I'm praying things, so my faith has grown as well. Then I I believe that we go through this uh, like tunnel like thing, you know, which is like, I know everybody's heard that story, but it's just, it's so consistent with everyone's story that has these near death experiences. Mm. Where um, So I just, it seems to me like that's just what happens. And I think we go to this other reality, if you want to call it heaven. And, um, and I do think that our loved ones are there. I think that um, possibly not all of them are there because I believe in reincarnation as well. I believe that we, um, Mm choose this life before we come into it i believe that uh we choose even choose our parents that's my own personal belief mm-hmm. and um and i think that we yeah we go to this other reality and i think that the the um the growth continues in, in what way who knows but i think the growth continues of, of the consciousness and i think that we are pieces of god experiencing life that's what i believe uh, yes yeah, so is it is it Alan Watts that says like the you are the ocean and the um the universe is the ocean and we are the waves. Oh, nice! I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's something similar as well. Like when I went through my uh, spiritual awakening, I had a, a out of body experience, and I, I was an atheist. Mm. I didn't believe in anything, and it was exactly the same experience of what how everybody describe it, where like so everything's just completely white and. Um, there was like beams of light, you know, standing there with souls standing there without any physical appearance. And it's like, you don't even communicate there. Like by mouth is telepathy. Mm. It's really, yeah. it was so profound um, that it actually did change the course of my life. Obviously I'm doing what I'm doing now. It's through the course of my spiritual awakening and out of body experience. So I do strongly believe that that's my personal opinion as well. I do strongly believe that there is, um, we choose, um, 
we choose our parents, we choose our experiences, 50% of the experience and the other, other 50% we, we live um, uh, through yeah. manifesting. Um, mm. So yeah, 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 totally relatable. Um, okay, so I think you, you pretty much answered the um, uh, question, but like um, my next question was, how do you define religion and spirituality? Oh, uh, I'm getting into dicey areas now. <laughs> <laughs> this is a soul awakening. Um, this was a podcast. <laughs> I think. I think. Um, I get, I get, it's it's kind of difficult to define, but I guess religion is more defined uh, rules, mm. and then and then I think spirituality just tends to be a bit more um, believing in something, believing in a higher power, but you're not. I guess you're not tied to specific. Uh, rules or mm. yeah yeah mm. or tied to specific beliefs yeah. i'd say that would be my definition of spirituality just from whenever i meet somebody and they say they're spiritual and i talk to them generally we have a, a similar similar um belief system mm. yeah. and i know for people following i know for people following religion because i talk to i've got christian friends i'm in a group with them and we always have conversations about spirituality and religion and stuff and I know for a lot of people, they see it as like um, a lot of people in religion, they see it as um, almost like a half assed attempt at being religious, being mm. spiritual, mm. because you're not because it's it's almost like, oh, well, you're must be because you're afraid to follow this one religion because, you know, there's more rules in it or, uh, you know, you have to do things in a specific way and you just mm. want to be a bit more free so that, you know, you don't have to follow a one religion. But yeah. I just think that's, that's, I understand where people are coming from, but, you know, I, I feel like, I definitely feel like some Christians that I've met, let's say, for example, and I'm only choosing Christians because I just tend to know a lot more Christians than any other faith. Um, but some Christians that I've met, I believe I'm more Christian than they are. I don't consider myself a Christian. Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah. that, I think that just because you say you follow a faith and you're religious doesn't mean that you are religious. Yeah. And yeah, I think just yeah. because you go to church on Sundays doesn't mean that you're religious. I think it's all it's more to do judge someone on their behavior not on what they not on what their label is. That's what mm -hmm. I always think. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Um what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Hmm. There's a long list for this one. Um, <laughs> uh, I I would say I would say I would say probably productivity. Funnily enough, <laughs> yeah. because and you know they quite often people say that coaches want to coach people in something that they've struggled with a lot in their life, mm -hmm. and because they know how much they've suffered with it. And then when they find the answer, they're like, wow, this is like, you know, everything's much better now. So I want to help somebody else with this. So mm. and that was very much with me as well. My, I, I, um, my, my understanding and my attachment to productivity and, f and definitely following a schedule was very much tied to school. Mm. So I hated it because mm. I didn't like school. I hated school. Mm. And um, so for me, being... Um, being productive and being organized it reminded me of school and, it, and then it brought back emotions that I had in school that mm. obviously went very nice mm. so it took me a long long time to get on board with um, following a schedule being organized and being productive mm. <clears throat> and when I did when I stopped um, being a PT and I got more into coaching or actually no when I was uh, being a PT I got into being more organized and following a schedule and then it, it just had such a big difference on the type of results that I was getting and uh, and how much faster I was achieving things. And um, that's what got me. That's what sold me on the idea of how important it is to have a schedule and to follow um, and to follow a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Love it. Um, OK, so do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? I think they definitely have the potential to. I don't think they always do, um, but I think that <clears throat> I think I think that it would be it would be um, and it's you know it's easy for me to sit here and say this because I didn't have a horrible beginning, but it would be amazing for people that have had horrible beginnings to almost be popped out of their life and shown the impact that they could have on people in the future because of the experience that they've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
like transformation. So I'm de definitely not going to go into detail on the type of things that I think, but yeah. because you know I don't want to be offensive or anything. But but I think that you know through a lot of trauma, when you've had that experience, you can you're able to help people on a level that somebody, let's say like me, could never do. Yeah, like it's again, like it's, I do. I, I think like I'm I'm very hopeful as like I do believe that because I do have it in me as well. Like uh, for so many so much of my young young life i've been through quite a lot of traumatic traumatic experiences now i'm d like working with people who are um on a similar boat boat and pa like you know you kind of just go really deep you do understand because you've gone through it yourself um so mm. kind of just resonate like you know the work that you yeah. do is it comes from acts of service and passion uh compassion yeah. and empathy for other people that you know, I can do it. So can you like, you, if, yeah. if I can do it, so can you and then that causes a ripple effect. It's not like, Oh, I can do it. And you know, but it's like a ripple effect. Somebody has to stand up and say, Yo, this is my trauma. This is what I've been through. This is my transformation. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Can you handle it? Can you go through it? And then they yeah. just then they 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 think I was like, Oh, gosh, like I have hope as well. Right? Mm. You know, they've been living the same way people at like society tell them you can't do anything with your trauma you can sit with your trauma and do nothing with it you know then um then you're gonna be that you know you're gonna be that so we need more people to just come and say actually you can change your life you can yeah. change your life okay like i think again you know it depends on the type of trauma it is because some people have been through some horrific stuff but yeah you know just, just, the, even if you can think of like like um like there's like there's plenty of famous people that have talked about it and i'm not saying you need to be like them but like i know oprah went through some horrific stuff in yeah. her childhood like really horrific and um and because of that and she says because of the way that she processed it and because of the lessons that she learned from it she's then able to speak to people in a way where um she can connect with them on a level that somebody else that hasn't been through that can't do that mm. Ultimately. So it's like it's like if somebody it's like if somebody came to me and they said, oh, I've got this trauma from childhood because I lost both my parents at an early age. Mm. I'd be like, listen, I can, I, can, I can set up a routine for you that'll probably help making you feel a bit better, but, but I'm yeah. not going to be able to help you yeah, in terms yeah. of relating to that because yeah. obviously I've never been through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. Um, so I am fully in present moment when? I am fully in present moment when? <laughs> yeah. This one... This one this one, I'm um, without a shadow of a doubt, one hundred percent, is uh, when the sun rises. Oh yes, and sunsets as well. So beautiful. And sunsets By as the well. Beach. But, oh but sun, yes. Sunrise is even more powerful. So when I before I came to Bangkok, I was on the coast in Phuket, and I was in this amazing uh, resort there, and the sunrises were amazing. I got up every morning to watch the sunrise, and I was saying to another friend there that I'd met that um makes me when i watch the sunrise it makes me feel more connected spiritually than mm. any other time in my life and in any other situation mm. and um and I, and I said it, it's funny because people meditate for years and years and years to feel how you can feel just by looking at the sun yeah because i think like when i've spoken to other people when they look at the sun it's like at least for me my mind just turns off and people spend years and years meditating to try and get to that point and when I look at the sun rising, and it's just it, it, and the other side of it is it just represents so much other stuff as well because obviously it represents life. Yes. Because obviously with the sun, it brings life to all the plants, like animals, like everything, mm. the oceans, everything. Yes. So yes. when that sun is rising, and uh, and it's early, you're up early, you know, no one else is around, and it's yeah. just, I just, it's really special. So for me, that is when I feel the most present when I'm just watching the sunrise. Oh, beautiful. Um, do you believe that there is an end to healing? That's a great question because I've thought about this recently. Oh, amazing. And, uh, <laughs> I've thought about this recently and it was because, I'll be honest, I got a bit irritated by um, hearing people talking about ancestral healing. Mm. And I just thought, man, you know, some of these people are like just trying to get their lives together. And then they finally heal the initial trauma that's maybe from childhood. And then they're told, actually, you're not healed yet. Now you need to heal <laughs> your ancestral trauma. 
And they're like, hang on a minute, I've not even got my life together, you know? And now you're telling me I'm going to heal something else. So it's like, I think that when you're healing and you're going through that kind of process, everything else is on hold because it has to be, because obviously it's traumatic and you're trying yes. to process what's happened. Yes. So you can't, you can't, I guess you, you are progressing because you're healing. But what I mean is like, you know, let's say you've got a goal with your career or you've got a goal with your health or you've got a goal with something else. It's kind of hard to focus on those if you're mm -hmm. focused on something traumatic, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so I think that, I don't know, I've got mixed feelings about it, really mixed feelings about it. Mm -hmm. Because on one hand, I'm like, I'm really open-minded. I just think there's so much we don't understand. There's so much we don't know. And I think that there's a lot of information that's encoded in our DNA mm -hmm. that's passed down from our parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, I very much believe in this ancestral trauma and ancestral information that's passed down. But on the other hand, I'm a bit like, oh man, we've got to draw the line somewhere. You know what I mean? So, so I, I don't know. I guess it, it depends. Very much depends on the person. I think if you're trying to get, if you're trying to go from one place to another place in your life, then I think maybe it's not the best thing to focus on because I just don't think it's. I don't think it's necessarily. Um, Again, it's a very personal, very, very, very uh, it depends on the person, but I don't think it's something that you necessarily need, need to focus on if you're just trying to improve your self development and you're trying to improve your self discipline and you're trying to, um, you're trying to Im improve uh, your lifestyle and you're trying to improve who you are as a person. I don't mm -hmm. think it's necessarily something you need to need to work on, but definitely childhood trauma, hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think like with the ancestral and generational, all of the trauma, I think when you're on this path, it just presents itself to you anyway, in everyday life. So, you know, like I had to like going back. So um, I ended up in a in a relationship and then I I stopped doing what I was doing pro productive because a lot of my trauma from my past was coming up in when you're triggered so it's like you see you're 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 kind of healing it as you're going along and moving in life and especially in career as well so there may be generational ancestral trauma around self-worth and you get into a job and you don't feel worthy right so mm -hmm. you're automatically doing it but it is a choice but i do i do think that like diving into it going in forcefully going into your ancestral it can do a lot of damage if you if you if you're not with the right people or, or you're doing it the yeah. right way um it will just come as it comes um yeah so yeah brilliant amazing <laughs> oh my god it's like I, I, I can't deal with this like healing anymore <laughs> Oh my god, I can't deal with it. <laughs> you think you got a handle on it, and then it's like, yeah, and then boosh. Okay, next one. <laughs> but to answer yeah. your question, no, I don't believe it ever stops. No, no. You, you come back again, man. You do you gotta yeah. do it again. <laughs> another lifetime, another like experience. Next time you come in like a, as a guy or woman or whatever, and you're experiencing that, and that's that's trauma itself. Um so um the world needs more of what? The world needs more of. What? Um, I'm just going to go with the cheesy, probably common response. <laughs> uh, love. Yes. We all do need that. So I got one last question. What is... Uh, the one message that you would like to share with somebody who's going through adversity and is is even going through awakening or transformation and darkness, what would you tell them if you were right in front of them? I would tell them that to look at how they're spending their time and to look at and pay attention to what kind of thoughts they're having and think, do those two align with the direction that I want to go in in life? And if they don't, what do I need to change? And what can I do in the next 24 hours to change it? Brilliant. Brilliant. I love it. How can people contact you, Jordan? Uh, mainly on Instagram at the moment. I've just started my YouTube channel. I'm going to be putting up a lot more information on there. Um, you can just type in Jordan Groves and you'll find me on there. And then on Instagram, it's um, Jordan Coach Groves. Brilliant. Amazing. Oh, what an interview. What like what an amazing conversation uh, uh, with you, Jordan. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah, thanks for having me.
Yeah, yeah, we we were actually gonna do this interview like in my previous series, and then I go, and then Jordan's like, "Oh, thanks, you you remember me now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. It's good. It's good to see you back in action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm back. I'm back with a bank. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much, Jordan. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madia Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.